Hello dear friends, welcome in Homeopathy Canada live session and uh, today we are uh, going to discuss some important point and uh, especially I invited one of the homeopath from Canada. He has experience and she is learning day to day life. Welcome Dr. Jessica. So she is she is a homeopath and she working very hardly in this field and recently I I came in touch with her, so I invite her to share their experience, especially in homeopathy. So for everyone, homeopathy is, this is not an easy task. It's, it's need lots of efforts. One homeopath, when he, he, he is talking with the, uh, with one patient and, uh, his or her suffering, he did lots of work. He, he collaborated, he, he recognized on the basic level how this condition start and what will be the consequences of this condition. That's why Dr. Hanneman in his Organon of Medicine the aphorism number is 148. He, in his footnote, he will tell us homeopathy is not an easy task and it need, it need patience. It need your observations and it need your efforts and daily routinely when you are, are studying the same thing again and again and again, and you will try to see these things in the patient. This will give you a good result. So on the basis of this, this is the base of our today conversation, because many patients after getting lots of medicines, lots of treatment, and after that, when they are disappointed, they will come in homeopathy and they will get results in few days. If, if the actual homeopath listen them, because if he has a habit of listening, he will definitely treat that patient on the table, 80% patient will be treated if he listen. Because when, when somebody having an abdominal complaint and he is vomit out, it will get a relief. Okay. This is the base of our session today. This is the base of our discussion today because we will discuss how we can treat the patient and how we can manage the patients. So I would like to welcome Dr. Jessica. So uh, hope so we learn from you, everyone, because lots of newcomers, they just started today or a few days before and they come in this field and they are really confused because there are lots of methods. And uh, I want to tell everyone, there is only one method in homeopathy, read Hahnemann. If anybody, anybody read Hahnemann, he don't need anyone else in homeopathy, especially for the newcomers. So I'm wel welcoming you and uh, uh, hope so we will learn lots of things from you. And uh, everyone, if anyone having any questions, please free to ask because only discussion will get something fruitful. Over to you, ma'am. Okay, I just want to say thank you for having me. It's the first time I've ever done a live or anything like that. So 
<laughs> just getting the jitters out, but I'm really grateful to be here today and talk homeopathy because I absolutely love it. And if you know me, you know it's a passion of mine for sure. So I'm really happy you brought up Hahnemann and the Organon because especially as a newer homeopath, you hear a lot of different methodologies of how to go about treating a patient, right? What type of approach? Approach is the best kind of thing and I've learned that you need to stick with the basics and that the Hahnemannian way is ultimately going to get you the best results and many times one remedy one remedy alone. when you give a single remedy it acts it's the best feeling in the world right instead of taking a case and you're confused or you don't know and you're handing out multiple remedies hoping that one is just going to be the one that acts when you take the time to actually read the Materia Medica, go deep into the medicines because everything you need is there, right? Everything is in the Materia Medica. And as practitioners, sometimes we can think we know the remedies well enough. So this is a perfect example of that. <laughs> and then it forces you to reassess the case and go deeper. So um, with that being said, today we're focusing on the strange, rare, and peculiar, right? Hahnemann in aphorism 153. So I'm gonna kind of be going back and through my notes because I don't know the aphorism word by word, <laughs> um, but I'll read it. So in aphorism 153, Hahnemann says, in the search for a homeopathic, okay, in this comparison of the collective symptoms of the natural disease with the list of symptoms of known medicine, in order to find among these an artificial morbific corresponding by similarity to the disease to be cured, the more striking, singular, uncommon, and peculiar, i.e. characteristic signs and symptoms of the case of disease are, chi are chiefly solely to be kept in view. Um, for it is more clearly that these very similar ones in the list of symptoms of the selected medicine must correspond in order to constitute um, affecting a cure. Okay. The more general and undefined symptoms, for example, loss of appetite, headaches, ability, restless sleep, discomfort, so forth, demand little attention when of that vague and indefinite character if they cannot be more accurately described. So basically all of that to say, <laughs> when taking a case, the most important thing is the striking and the peculiar. The less common a symptom is, the, like, the likelihood that that will be the one symptom that will lead, lead you to the remedy to cure the case. And when we're looking at rubrics, uh, I think it's important to use a repertory, right? But I've come from, I've come from the mindset of the repertory is supposed to be a tool. As homeopaths, we really, really need to understand the materia medica and study our medicine. Because if you just put a bunch of rubrics into the repertory, you're going to come up with whatever remedies are going to come up based on whatever you generate into that program, right? So what I found is that in regards to the striking peculiar and the characteristic, I also need to rely on what is the most um, reliable symptom. What never changes the case? What does the patient say to you with so much intensity that it is just 100% a target every single time. And what I've been doing is I will take that single rubric and then I will examine the remedies in that rubric, right? And I find that obviously if you're zoning in on a very particular or peculiar striking characteristic symptom, you're not going to have a rubric with 100 remedies. You're going to have one with maybe 5 to 15. And because there's less remedies relating to that symptom, you know already that that symptom is strange, right? Okay, so now I'm gonna present a case to you guys um, and I'll talk about how I kind of failed and then how we found the remedy afterwards. So uh, I had a male patient, mid thirties, and he came to me with two chief complaints. The first was longstanding wart and chronic migraines. So I usually like to open up a case with the basic or more less sensitive type of topics just to kind of build a rapport with the patient as well and kind of see how, how they are. So I just say, tell me about the wart. Let's go with that, right? 
So he had this wart for 25 years on the right middle finger, right on the side. And it's been there for 20 years. There's nothing characteristic about this wart. There's no pain, no bleeding, there's no growth. It literally has just stayed there for 20 years. And I asked him if he's had any other history of any other warts. So he says, yes, I have. I had had a wart on the right thumb and then also on the foot. So I go, okay, so those went away. And he said, yes, those went away, but this one has 20 some odd years. I go, okay, that is kind of peculiar in itself in that you have a wart that's been there for so, so long. So he had treated the other warts top with apple cider vinegar and they responded and went, this one didn't budge. Other than this, there was nothing extraordinary in wart cases, but I had to keep that in the back of my mind because A, it's a chief complaint for the patient and B, it's been there for so long. So I go, tell me about the migraines. And then this is when we kind of got into the crux of the case. When the patient started telling me about his migraines, he was just off the rails with these symptoms. It was like he was almost living the migraines as he was telling me. So you already know when the patient is explaining their symptoms with such intensity that they are very, very important to the case, right? So he's had these migraines for the last 10 years. They are roughly every two weeks, okay? Um, they get so bad on an intensity scale that he rates them um, a 15 to 17 out of 10 on the pain scale, like debilitating migraine. Um, they can last for up to 17, 18 hours in a day, okay? And um, he had tried three Advils at a times, never responded. He would Tylenols or a combination of both, never Worked. And then eventually went to his medical doctor and medical doctor said, we'll prescribe you some type of sort of neuro drug. And the patient declined saying, no, I don't really want to be on a medication like that in my life. So he was for an alternative route. Um, so one of his friends had introduced him to Excedrin, which was a pain medication over the counter from the States. And he would utilize that with some success. And I think it's a combination. I don't know 100% me but i believe it's a combination of it has tylenol plus caffeine and i think another NSAID in there um but even still with those he would have to use one to three per time just to reduce the pain never to really fully get rid of it okay so i say tell me about your migraines and luckily when the patient i said that he was very communicative so i got a lot of information that i had to break down in the first instance so word for word this is what the patient said it is always in the exact same spot, the left side of my head all of the time. I can feel it just talking about it, like a nail driving over my eye. Sometimes I will be driving and my left eye will close a bit. It looks like I'm a little bit half droopy. droopy. And he was literally like going like this. He was holding this area like right where it was. Um, but I I need to distract myself when I'm having a migraine. Even though I'm having it, I can't just rest there. I need to move or hum or sing or cry. Maybe doing something for distraction. One time I had a migraine so bad, I didn't know what to do. I was slurring my speech and just crying because it was so bad. Okay, so all, all of this information in the sentence that I had to break down. So for homeopathic certain things, obviously you'll know like location, sensation, modality, and concomitant. And if you get a hold or a grasp on those, then you're likely to get a really good idea, picture of the, the symptom. Okay, so the location, where was it? He had an affinity for left side migraines, always on the left side. It never changed, it never moved, it never was on the right side, sometimes always on the left, very clear. And he said it was always above the left eye and he was holding his head as he was talking to me. So that right here is the left frontal image, right? So right here we know it's always here and always. It doesn't extend, it doesn't move, it doesn't radiate, okay? Um, in regards to the sensation, that it will start with a low throb and then it will go to a drilling. And he's like, it feels like someone is drilling a hole into my head. It's very specific in this spot. And I go, okay, tell me what else happens with the migraine. And he goes, my left eye will tear up and my left eye will feel heavy and weighted, like he had mentioned before, like I cannot open it. It's like my eye and my vision are impacted. 
And sometimes he'll be driving home with the migraine and his eye will just be so heavy and just like this. And he just like feels like it's just blurred out, out of the left eye. Um, he, I said, okay, what more can you tell me, right? Always those open-ended questions because we never want to guide the um, interview. And he goes, well, when I have it, I constantly need to be doing something. I cannot rest with it. Again, he's very, very restless, right? And I said, anything more, anything more you can tell me about this migraine? And he goes, I vomited before with the migraines. I burp up. I vomit because the pain is so nauseating. And I go, okay, when you vomit, is it food? Have you just eaten? Nope. I vomit vile just because of the pain. Okay, so now you're getting, you're seeing more and more of this picture, right? And I go, anything else you can tell me? Is there a particular time when you get the migraines? And he says, yes, generally when I wake up in the morning, I'm you, or I'm usually waking up with them, and it's usually in the morning. And I go, okay, out of all, when you're having your headaches and your migraines, how often is the true picture? And he's like, all of the time. So all of this information was very, very reliable for me. And you could see that the, because he had, even though he was utilizing the analgesics and the pain, they weren't responding. He wasn't able to suppress the symptoms, right? So a lot of people, they can't tell you their headaches or their migraines because they'll pop an Advil, they'll pop a Tylenol, and they don't really get that true picture. Luckily, but unfortunately for the patient, even though he was taking these pain meds, they weren't doing anything. And so he just had to live with this migraine. And that's helpful for me because then we get that true picture, right? Um, and I go, okay, what else? What more can you tell me? And this is from one of my um, supervisors or teachers over the years, Dr. Joseph Kellerstein. He was always the best with asking the question, what more can you tell me? And that's it, right? Because if you allow the patient the opportunity to speak, it allows them to sit in the experience a little bit longer and really give more information. So he goes, I get super, super hot. I need the cold. And I undress, I turn on the fan, I open the window. If it's the winter, I go outside and I'll walk for in the cold air. Um, and I also will take very, very cold baths. And the patient literally said this word for word, like cold, 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 ice cold showers. I'm like, okay, okay, there's a lot of information. Cold is important. And I go, anything else that you do that makes your headache better? And he goes, usually I'll wrap a blanket or a towel around my and um and definitely the cold 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 i go okay great i go what brings on your headaches because as homeopaths we care about the etiology or the cause of the migraines or things that can trigger your symptoms right that's very important to us in order to find remedy and he said with a surety usually it's stress mental stress or a lack of sleep from stress so if he's had a stressful day a stressful in, uh, situation this will usually bring on the migraine. So there's some sort of emotional component related to the migraine. He also said dehydration if he doesn't drink enough and also if he doesn't eat frequently enough in the day. And I go, okay, so your migraine started 10 years ago. What happened roughly 10 years ago or a few months prior to the onset of your migraines in your life, whether emotional, physical, uh, spiritual, anything, just can you relate it to something? And he actually divulged to me, you know, I took the yellow fever vaccine. Um, and approximately three months later, this is when his headaches had started. And he had put together that piece. And I thought, okay, that's important. If a patient tells me something, I will take that information into consideration. And then I went on to do kind of more of the general case, just to kind of see what kind of constitution remedy would be there so there was possibly a linkage of the onset of the migraines to caffeine um, he does not do well with onions with tea or with spicy foods um, he even said like onions especially raw onions I feel like they hit a nerve and will cause migraine um, and then with the spicy foods he goes ginger garlic those types of spices as well as heat spicy um, and in regards to the emotional mental picture of the patient, this person is relatively stable, like they don't have too much trauma in the past, not a lot of emotional experiences that I felt were related to the case. But what I could pull out, that there was a strong sense of religiosity there and moral honesty was very important. And 
prayer was very important to the patient. That was the most I could get. And out of his desires, uh, the patient loved sugar, like needed to have something sugary every single night before bed. And as a homeopath, I also like to observe the patient in front of me. What could I grasp physically by looking at the patient in order to help me find him the right remedy? And I noticed his skin was very, very greasy, uh, especially on the face. Like you could see this thicker grease. And then also that he had moles all over. And I said, you have a lot of moles on your face. Like, is it throughout your body? He's like, yeah, after, like it's throughout his body. in moles. Okay. So here's my, that's my case. And I start thinking, obviously, with all, everything he's told me, we got the warts. We have the ill effects from, possible ill effects from vaccination. We have the moles all over the body, the overgrowths, all of this stuff. And the aggravations from uh, spicy foods and onions, raw onions particularly, and the interesting headache of like that boring digging feeling into the head. And he said like it feels like a nail is pierced on the left side. So I, I didn't really repertorize this case. I just go, okay, antipsychotic remedy um, that, that has this peculiar symptom on a nail to the head, has the warts, and, I, and that has these, these aggravations, and I prescribe Thuya, right? So Thuya just matched the case for me. And if you go to um, the Materia Medica, look at Borgi, for example, one of the first things it says is it acts on the skin. Um, it's relation to the production of pathological vegetations, uh, wart increases, and uh, spongy tumors are very important. Um, ill effects of the vaccination. And then the head pain, it was pain as if pierced by a nail. So literally, almost word for word. Stuff from tea. I think I forgot to mention that, but the patient said also he avoids tea because anytime he drinks a tea, like again, those spicy types of things he feels like a migraine is going to come on and it also says left sided headache with greasy skin of face so i'm like okay i have my remedy so i give thuya 30. so t-h-e-a-t right at three yeah t-h-u-j-a oh Tuja. Uh, okay oh. Yeah, yeah sorry yes yeah so i give thuja okay um and i gave it in a 30c potency and I decided to go with a lower, lower potency just because there wasn't a lot of mentals in the case. And we're trying to do more physical symptoms. And I know that it's a great psychotic remedy. I know it's good for warts, like everything I mentioned. So I give in to you, and the patient had a, a wonderful reaction. Um, so within a couple of days of the first dose, had, I believe, an aggr what was an aggravation. So a worsening of migraines he had said it was the worst migraine he ever ex ever experienced and for me i was like okay let's just ride this out like try not to take the pain medications if you can of course if you need to i'm not going to tell you not to but just see what what comes from it and um after that point he had said that uh the migraine started to reduce in intensity and in frequency so from instead Two times a week, they were now once a week. And from a pain scale of like 17 out of 10, they were now on a pain scale of like 6 to 8 out of 10. So becoming more manageable. So we had a reduction in frequency and intensity. And the interesting thing is, and I have these beautiful pictures to prove it. I just don't, I can't show you, but um, I, I can maybe post them to my page later. But I had the wart responded within the first week of remedy as well. So it started to actually grow, 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 grow. And then the skin around the wart started to exfoliate. And then I continued the patient on the remedy. And um, we did our first, this was after our first follow-up. Um, and then the wart had kind of fallen off, but you could still see the roots there. And you could still see that it wasn't fully resolved. And he was still having these migraines, even though there was an improvement in the intensity and the frequency. So before changing the remedy, if you think you really have a good remedy, the best thing to do is to scale up your potency, right? Because if you scale up on your potency, 
you would anticipate that you should continue an, an improvement in your symptoms. But if you don't improve, then maybe let's look at something, right? Maybe this is a similar remedy, but not the similar, not the perfectly matching remedy. So I, I scale up and sure enough, we're, we're kind of at this plateau. And the patient um, is still having these migraines. So as a practitioner and as a patient, you're both happy because A, you have these improvements, but as a practitioner, I'm not that happy because I know we can make more movement and I know I can help you. And luckily the patient was willing to continue working with me. That's the important thing I to stress the patients too, is that with homeopathy, you're stimulating your own body response. And when you have chronic ailments, it's important to give the body the ability to adapt over time to heal itself like these chronic of you know 10 plus years and the chronic part of 20 years well you know i do believe that homeopathy is rapid i've seen it work in rapid cases but in chronic cases sometimes you need to give it some time like i usually say like three six months sometimes a year depending on how severe your your ailments are and how deep-seated your disease is, right so now as a practitioner i had to go to the materia medica and reassess this case because this patient was forcing me to do it. <laughs> and I was happy to. So what did I decide to do? I decided to take a single rubric again by Kent. And I said, head pain, boring, digging, screwing, forehead, eminence, frontal, left. So left pain in the frontal eminence. And again, there's three remedies there. Argentum, nitrogum, oleander and thuja so thuja is in there right that's why we kind of saw that response but i saw argentum nitricrum and it was bolded and to be honest it's not a remedy i really did a deep dive into before i really study it before and i bias score towards thuja and i think that's important to understand too as homeopathic practitioners sometimes we bias our our remedy choices on our knowledge but homeopathy forces you to really think out of the box and really study a case in depth so because i can't repertory for that i went to argentum and kent's lectures and let me just read this to you um so from kent lectures, what does it say it is an anti-psychotic and cures its own kind of bleeding warts and excrescences it often acts wonderfully in smallpox and in the complaints that follow vaccination. The complaints are all made better in the open air, even in the cold winds. He craves the cold wind blowing in his face. The greasy shining face is characteristic of Argentinicum, Natrum muriaticum, and Thuya. Okay, so now Natrum Mur is thrown in there, but you know, no salty craving, you have depression, and no, um, like excessive thirst, nothing that really. So I'm like, okay, Thuya Arginet. Um, and then it says it has a violent craving for sugar, which I know the patient and mentioned he has to eat something sweet every single night. With the pains, he is restless, must keep in continual motion, vomiting and purging with complaints. There are many headaches, congestions, boring, cutting pains. Most pains are ameliorated by a close fitting bandage. And the patient had mentioned he will usually wrap a towel or a blanket around his head. So I'm like, oh my goodness, I couldn't get any better than this. Let me keep reading. And this is when you're a homeopath. Other homeopaths will know, like, this is when you start becoming super obsessed with your medica and you just want to read, read, read. So I go to Dr. Butler and I find a document there and it goes, few remedies have shown greater affinity for the nervous system. Several important heads belong to this drug. Excessive congestion of the head with heaviness and stupefying dullness of the head. Pain on one side of the head, boring and the left frontal eminence until he loses his senses, right? And the patient had said, sometimes it gets so bad, that I don't know what to do, I just cry. It's like the patient just loses his senses. Infraorbital neuralgia on the left side, right? And the patient mentioned, my eye goes blurry, I get eye pain and I'm like oh my goodness it just even got that eye neuralgia right on the left side and neuralgia of the head and face which always takes away her eyesight. Herring 
says, one of the best remedies we have for hemicrania, so one-sided headache, a deep-seated neurotic disease, frequently boring pain in the head, which is worse in the left frontal hemisphere. This boring is relieved by tight bandaging, hence the wearing of a tight hat relieves. It is excited by any mental exertion or anything that depletes the nervous system. So mental exertion, stress, but then he goes on to say anything else that depletes the nervous system includes the loss of fluids, patient had said dehydration, the loss of sleep or mental strain. And the patient said, you know, if I lose sleep from stress, I'll wake up with it too. So sometimes the pain becomes so severe that the patient loses his senses and the paroxysms of pain frequently, frequently culminate in vomiting of bile or sour foods. <laughs> so I mean, like, can you get even better than this? And I was so happy because I, I actually found this remedy through this patient and I learned so much about it. And then I went to Bojur and then Berkey. And you have um, the modality of better cold air, cold bathing, and um, worse mental exertion. So it just fit. And I decided to th tell the patient, the next time you get a migraine, take a couple of doses of Argentum Nitricum, dilute the pillules in water, 30 C, and I want you to rapid dose. Because the intensity of the pain was so intense, like, high, right? I needed to match my dosing to meet that intensity. And I just felt like a couple of doses probably wasn't enough. But I knew if I put in water and he could rapid dose every five minutes, let's see what happens. And literally the first time he did it, within 10 minutes, it went from like over a 10 scale to like a one to two out of 10. And I said, that's amazing and he continued rapid dosing and with a, within a couple of hours he was able to go about his day like nothing had happened and he didn't have that fatigue or that exhaustion that usually takes over after migraines and so my next steps are literally going to um to, to increase the potency to kind of treat the patient constitutionally to see if we can really nix these migraines out because now even the frequency and the intensity has decreased with the arginine and interestingly, two to three weeks after that dose for the headache, the wart went away, like completely. And I didn't even, I totally forgot about the wart, to be honest, because I was just trying to help the patient with the, uh, with the migraines. And I said, wow, like your wart, it's completely gone away. And um, they had mentioned that they started using chlorophyll-based products, so like a wheatgrass. But the patient has utilized like spirulina and wheatgrass and things past, and it's never done that. So I'm gonna take it as it was the remedy <laughs> because we know arginic can, is also an antipsychotic and treats the warts. But um, once we increase the potency, it'll be interesting to see what happens. But I thought this was a beautiful case to share because it shows how, you know, you can start with one remedy, a similar remedy with the strange rare peculiar, and then as a practitioner, delve into a deeper remedy, and really get a remedy that helps the patient and they don't have to rely on you know, suppressive medications or, you know, they can go about their day and all they have to do is just take a homeopathic remedy and they find relief instead of having hours of su suffering. And so for me, it's very rewarding naturally and holistically. And I thought this was a good case to share. <laughs> So every newcomer here, and if you want to know what is the value of laws, homeopathic laws in homeopathy, you can see what is law of similar and what does that, uh, that law of similar do in patients. What we are looking for, we are looking for symptom similarity. Sometimes if you, so she find out one remedy, after that he gives some relief, but not fully relief. It means still we have a lacking there. We have to find more, we have to go more close, more similar because that's why 
we we always reading materia medica and what we are reading we are comparison each other compare each other one symptom is present in one remedy maybe the similar symptom is present in another remedy but the basic concept is that we have to know the core of the patient how he react how he explain because sometimes uh, craving for sugar there are lots of remedy who have a craving for sugar but what is different how that patient having these problems how this started how he react boning hasan give a wonderful method to recognize the whole picture in one collab location sensation modalities causation mm -hmm. and the concomitant symptoms and he gave lots of concomitant and if you don't know the concomitant you will miss the case definitely you miss the case and it was very very interesting case and if anyone who is practitioner he can really feel the intensity of the face of this doctor <laughs> and how is he explaining because she know she know what she is doing and she know the value of that symptom and symptom similarity how the symptoms are similar to each other and when anyone recognize he, because this is not easy task she has to spend lots of hours on this case and then when after lots of heavy labor you got the results you got the prize definitely it more relaxing because when you get these remedy you never forget these experience in your whole life because it now this is the part of doctor now he this knowledge will stuck with that doctor and never forget in whole life whole life yes. this is called experience that's why homeopathy is experience it's it's demand experience so it's very interesting and congratulate to you so and if anyone anyone who is looking for this session if anyone having any question regarding this case you can ask we are free to answer this your question please for sure sure i just to mention too um because you know you get as a practitioner uh we always get the questions like i have a headache what can i use for a headache and i i wanted to demonstrate this case because it had such clear symptomology symptomology that homeopathy we are treating the person and their experience with that headache so if you tell me you have a headache sure i have hundreds of remedies but my job is to go deep understand your experience symptom by symptom and then match that to the remedy and i think that it's important for the public to understand that um when you take a remedy and sometimes it doesn't work right away it doesn't mean that homeopathy doesn't work it just means that you don't have the right remedy right it means we just need to go a little bit deeper we need to study the case and it also what i love about homeopathy too is it forces you to get to know your body right it really forces you to go deep down within like understand your and then when you start working with a homeopathic practitioner and we're asking all these questions that nobody ever asked you before, you start to think oh maybe this is something Jessica needs to know or maybe you know and you become so much more self-aware and with continued homeopathic um, treatment your vitality just increases you start to feel better and you know over time you have this this you feel free i don't know how to explain it but you just feel so much better and free because you just see that your body is so resilient and able to adapt so so before you used to feel aged and like your symptoms had this hold on you but you really just realize they're just communicating to you and your symptoms are that form of communication and once you really just like surrender into that communication and just listen to what the body's saying um 
and then you're able to communicate that to your practitioner, we're able to take that information, what the body is saying, and provide you some relief. So I think it's important that when you really start working with a homeopathic, homeopathic practitioner, sorry, that um, the more you go into your symptoms or the more information you provide, the better it is. Like nothing is too silly nothing is too crazy nothing is too peculiar or uncommon it's good right and i just want to continue your wording dr hanneman almost 270 years before he give he gives some explanation about homeopath this is the footnote of 148 and he tell the search for the remedy that is homeopathically the most suitable in all regard give for a given disease state is a laborious occasionally a very laborious pursuit while there are prize worthy books for facilitating this process this is not an easy task we have to open book by book how to find out where to find out what is the symptom what is the value of symptom value of symptom is much more needed in every single case if you don't know what is common and what is uncommon you will never succeed in homeopathy and he says repertories and materia medicas it is still necessary, necessary to study the source themselves, that is, reports of proving. Mm -hmm. And 90% of people never read provings. And they are believing on reports, this and that. If you read the proving, the actual symptoms of the, what, what, are, what our medicine gave to us, you definitely never miss these things. And many sided circumspections, serious consideration is also required. And the best reward for this is the awareness of a duty truly fulfilled. So in this case, you truly fulfilled your duty. And that's why we got the remedy and the patient is happy and he is free of disease. So any questions, anyone having any questions regarding this case, you are welcome. So we will consider all the questions if you have any questions. And if you don't have any questions, then we will uh, stop our conversation now. So hope so. We will see you together again. We will discuss it again. And hope so all the newcomers after listening this case hope so you get the confidence and you will read the books you will discuss each other so we can know homeopathically homeopathy more better way so thank you so much dr jessica so for your time for us and time for everyone hope so lots of people learn from you and if any questions after this session you have uh dr jessica will give answers or uh, i will uh, i will send all the questions to her so in next time she can answer your questions thank you so much thank you thank so much have a great day thank you bye thank you bye, bye.